Hello everyone, welcome back to the video. So today we're going to be going over physical versus chemical properties. Specifically, how do we distinguish a physical property from a chemical property? Your do now is just to tell me whether these are substances, these substances are elements or compounds. Homework is to have a good weekend. So, just to go over that real quick. Oop. Sorry about that. FR is an element. MGS is a compound, because remember compounds are when you have two or more different elements. F2, that is a diatomic element. That means when an element naturally comes in pairs. And remember, the elements that naturally come in pairs, think of the chemistry Christmas elf, Brinkelhoff. Spell his name, B-R-I-N-C-L-H-O-F. Brinkelhoff, those are all the symbols of all the elements that are diatomic. Just to clarify, that would be bromine, iodine, nitrogen, chlorine, hydrogen, oxygen, fluorine. And HNO3, that's a compound. So, before we get really into the lesson, I do want to talk about an issue I've had with a lot of exit tickets. Um, the issue being that, remember, I taught you guys whether... We're, whether we're looking at a compound or an element. Never taught you how to name a compound. So these people clearly looked up the answers online or tried to look up the answer online and answered it, but they got the answer completely wrong. Again, guys, I cannot stress this enough. Do not just Google the answer because most of the time you're going to end up Googling something you either haven't learned or something that's just far too complicated to be the answer. Focus on the lesson. I tell you what the answer is like a thousand times. So quick learning check. Just a reminder from yesterday, which one is heterogeneous, which one is homogeneous. Your smoothie is homogeneous. It is a uniform mixture. A salad is a heterogeneous mixture. We could easily pick out those tomatoes or the lettuce. So it's not uniformly mixed. A chunky stew is also a heterogeneous mixture. Again, we could pick out things very easily. They're so it's not like it's uniformly mixed. Sand. Sand, believe it or not, is also a heterogeneous mixture. The reason for that is because to separate the salt from the sand, all we have to do is pour water over it. And as a result, when pouring water over it and having a filter there, the salt is going to dissolve in the water and then separate from the sand, creating salt water. We didn't need any additional energy to separate that mixture. So because of that, sand is considered a heterogeneous mixture. That's a little bit of a tricky one. So particle diagrams. Um, so many times you're going to be asked to identify a element, compound, or mixture using these particle diagrams. You will never be asked to identify whether they are homogeneous or heterogeneous mixtures based on these diagrams. You just need to be able to identify that it's a mixture. So how do we do that? So first, by the way, if you're writing notes with this video, I do recommend that you draw these in your notes. The first one, notice how all of the dots are the same color and none of them are connected. So because all the dots are the same color and none of them are connected, this would be considered an element. Next one, notice how these dots, again, are all the same color, but they're connected in twos, they're in pairs. This is also considered an element, but specifically, it is a diatomic element. Remember, when I say the word di, I mean two. So, this is an atom with two different, with, this is an, this is an atom that naturally comes in pairs. So, one, two. Again, they're the same color, so it is an element, but because they come in pairs, it is a diatomic element. Next one. Notice how all these dots, they're not connected and they're different colors. Because of that, this diagram is considered a mixture. Finally, last one. Each of these diagrams has one green dot, two pink. All of them have the same proportions. So because they all have the same proportions, that is considered a compound. All right, next one. Ignore that. So, quick little learning check. Let's see how we would define these particle diagrams. So, first one. Again, uh, you've got green, you've got blue. They're not connected. They, they are not connected to each other. 
So because it's two different colors and they're not connected, this is considered a mixture. Next one. Number two has three different colors. One, two, three. Because it has three different colors and none of them are connected, this is also considered a mixture. Number three got some people confused. So let me clarify something. Number nine is considered a compound because each of these black dots has four white dots and it's only this. There's nothing else in there. So number three, again, has a black dot with the four white dots. That's great, but it also has a bunch of random purple dots. So because it has random purple dots and this, mic and this, um, this structure right here, and they're not connected, that means that this, number three, is also a mixture. Number four, again, it's got two different colored dots. None of them are connected, so number four is also a mixture. Number five, all of these dots are the same color, so we know it's an element, and they come in pairs. So because they come in pairs, this is a diatomic element. Number six, all these dots are the same color, therefore it is an element. Number seven, we've got this green circle with a white circle attached to it, but we also have this black circle with four green circles attached to it. Because of that, not, these are not the same structures, so that is a mixture. Number eight, all these circles are the same color, so because of that, eight is an element. Number nine, I said before, is a compound. The reason why we know it's a compound is because all of these structures are the same. Yes, you have more than just one colored dot, but each of these black dots has four white dots. There's nothing else in here except for the black dots with four white dots attached. So that makes it a compound. Number 10, you got two different colors, nothing's attached, so it is a mixture. Number 11, you have these blue dots. Each of them have two white dots, and all these structures are, have the same number of things. There's nothing else in here. So because of that, number 11 is a compound. And number 12, you see we got these two green dots attached, and we also have a bunch of white dots that are not attached. Because we got two different colors, none of them are attached. This is also a mixture. Alrighty, so now what we're going to do is we're going to get into... Um, we're going to get into our next slide, which is our physical versus chemical properties. So let's get into it. So this is my brother, Jake. Um, from the picture, what can you tell about him? He's very muscular. Some people say that he looks kind of tough. He's a football player. He's a running back, to be specific, but you wouldn't know that from the picture. Um, he likes to work out. He's very muscular. But did you also know? My brother is severely allergic to dogs, so if a dog licks his face, his face will blow up like a balloon. He cries whenever he watches any Christmas movie. His rap name used to be Luscious Flow, and he is an amazing cook. She might be wondering, well, Miss Wiswall, why are you telling us these embarrassing things about your brother? Well, first of all, it is my job as a big sister to do that. But the second reason is because it's the same thing as chemical properties. You don't know these things about my brother unless you see him react. Same thing with chemical properties. You don't know the chemical properties of an element, compound, or mixture unless you see it react. So physical properties. Yes, I want you to write this down. It's a lot of stuff. I apologize. If I go too fast in the notes, just pause the video and copy it down and move on. So. Some physical properties, um, they, include, um, they include things that um, you can observe without changing the properties of that, um, su that substance or the mixture. So for example, um, it can include the density, mass, weight, volume, color, hardness, boiling point, melting point, ductility, which is the ability to pull a metal through a wire. More on that when we get to metals versus non-metals. Malleability, the ability to bend something and viscosity, a liquid's resistance to flow. So, for example, um, if you compare maple syrup to water, maple syrup is very thick. It's not going to flow very easily. But meanwhile, water is not very thick. It's going to flow very, very easily. So because of that, you could say that maple syrup has a higher viscosity than water. Meanwhile, chemical properties, you can only observe these when a substance or mixture is reacting. 
So for example, these can include flammability, the ability to combust, which again, more on that in the, in the, organic, uh, chem the organic chemistry unit. Corrosive, which corrosive just basically means the breaking, that this particular item can break down organic substances. Not to get too graphic, but an example of this is if I had a highly concentrated form of sulfuric acid, which I know sulfuric acid is a common thing that's in facial creams or exfoliating scrubs, but I'm talking the pure form, like 18 molar, what those container may be 0.25 molar, which is very weak. It will not hurt you. But if I had 18 molar and I put a drop of it on my hand, it is so corrosive that my skin would melt and probably parts of my muscle would melt too because it breaks down organic structures. Explosive, color changing. So if I mix two uh, clear substances and they turn purple, that is a chemical property. pH, whether it's acidic or basic, and taste. Let me walk you through a scenario. Imagine you wake up in the morning, you go through your usual routine, you brush your teeth, it's just part of the day. You go to the fridge and you see a big bottle of orange juice and you think, wow, nothing sounds better than a big sip of orange juice. Without remembering that you brushed your teeth before, you take a sip. What does it taste like? Easy. It tastes horrible. It tastes like a nightmare. That's because that is a chemical property. When you drink orange juice or something acidic after brushing your teeth, that's a chemical reaction that happened inside your mouth forming that disgusting taste. Reactions can also have physical and chemical changes. So a physical change is a change that does not change the item into a new chemical. This can include cutting, ripping, phase changes, specifically solid to liquid, melting, liquid to gas, condensation, gas to liquid, sorry, uh, liquid to gas evaporation, I apologize, gas to liquid condensation, liquid to solid freezing. And um, you also have your solid to gas, gas to solid, but more on that when we get to our phase changes. Uh, you could also also, there's grinding, folding, bending. So, for example, let's say Ms. Wiswall goes on to Castle Learning to see how many students did the um, Castle Learning assignment, which earns an extra five points on your test, and she sees that nobody did it. And she just gets so angry, urgh, so angry, that she decides to take a chainsaw, turn it on, and psh, cut her door in half. Now, the door didn't change. It's still made of wood. The only thing I changed about it was its shape. So again, because the door's chemical composition didn't change, that is a physical change. And again, you're writing this down in your notes. Meanwhile, a chemical change is when you do change the chemical composition of an item. This can include burning, rusting, also known as oxidation, fermentation, the process of making alcohol or bread, uh, cooking, combustion, things rotting or becoming moldy, things decaying. These are all chemical changes. So for example, instead of chopping down the door, let's say I burnt the door instead. I set the door on fire. What happens is the door becomes a pile of ashes. It is no longer the hard wood that we're familiar with. It is now just a pile of ashes. I changed the chemical composition of the door and that's a chemical change. Another way of thinking about it, think about baking cookies. Before we bake the cookies, it has that raw egg in it and we can't eat it. But when we stick it in the oven and we bake it, the proteins in that egg that we're cooking change and the properties of the cookie change so that we can eat it. Same thing with raw meat. When we cook it, uh, it goes like, for ch example, chicken. Chicken goes from like a pinkish color to a white color when we cook it. And that is one of the signs of a chemical change. But wait, evaporation and burning involve temperature change. So how do I determine whether a reaction is physical or chemical? That's a really good question. It all depends on whether a new product is formed. And again, just a friendly reminder, reactants are on the left side and products are on the right. So for example, if we look at the first one, we have H2O solid 
it's going to melt and become H2O liquid. Notice how the H2O is still the same on both sides of the equation. It didn't change. So because it didn't change, this is considered a physical change. Meanwhile, let's look at the formation of water. It involves H2 plus O2, and when it's combined, it forms into 2H2O. That becomes something different. You take two elements and it suddenly becomes a compound. So because of that, this is a chemical change. And finally, the signs of a physical and chemical change. Again, I want you to write all this stuff down. This is some good, important information. What are the four signs of a chemical change? By the way, anything with a little star that I added means that this could also be considered a physical change under certain conditions, and I'll, I'll stress them as I talk. First, a change in temperature. An increase in heat can result in an exothermic reaction. Meanwhile, a decrease in heat or an absorption of heat results in an endothermic reaction. So what do I mean by this? So exothermic, think of it like exhaling. <sighs> When we breathe out, we are releasing air from our lungs. Same thing here. Exothermic is the release of energy. So uh, when energy is being released or heat is being released in this case, that is when an object suddenly becomes hotter. It's when I take two room temperature liquids, I pour one into the other, and it becomes hotter. That is an exothermic reaction. Meanwhile, if I take two room temperature liquids, pour them into each other, and suddenly it becomes cold, and that is the result of an absorption of heat. It's absorbing heat. And that is an endothermic reaction. Your second sign of a chemical change is a change in color. So again, that example of taking two clear liquids, mixing them together, and all of a sudden they turn purple. That is a sign of a chemical change. Third, a precipitant forms. Think of it kind of like a snow globe how you've got the clear liquid and then you've got these solid flakes in it. That's kind of what a precipitant looks like. How is it formed? Take two regular liquids, two clear liquids, you pour one to the other and all of a sudden this like white cloud forms. That is because two liquids are mixing together to form a solid. And that precipitant forming is one of the signs of a chemical reaction. Finally, Another sign is gas being released. Think of it like bubbling. If I take two liquids, pour one into the other, and all of a sudden it starts bubbling and some smoke is released, that is your gas being released. It could also be referred to as gas being liberated. And that is a sign of a chemical change. Now, in terms of the change in temperature, think of it like boiling water or, um, or anything like that. If we're boiling water or if we're freezing water, yes, that's a chemical, that is a uh, temperature change, but again, it didn't form a different product. It's just changing the state of matter. So because of that, that, is cons that would be considered a physical change. Meanwhile, a change in color. Think about um, if you've ever sanded wood. If you sand wood, all of a sudden, it becomes a little bit of a lighter color. You could also think of it when you are... I know with some pencils, or even better, plastic. If you've ever had like a plastic pen with a cap and you've bent part of it and you see it suddenly becomes a lighter color from bending it, that's a physical change. You're not changing the plastic, you're just stretching it. And that's the difference between a physical and chemical change in terms of changing color. I just wanted to kind of give you guys that idea. So. What I'd like you to do now is I want you to work on the exit ticket, and the exit this week is just asking you to give me one chemical property and one physical property. And as always, thank you for listening, and I hope you guys have a wonderful, wonderful day.